Hey guys, welcome back to Beauty and the Baby. I am Dr. Tanisha Bibbs and I'm excited about our season one. Listen, this episode is all about newborn nutrition, mommy nutrition, okay? We're gonna talk to some expert about breastfeeding, uh, tongue ties, we're gonna have a conversation about being 40 and having a baby, oh my God. Listen guys, follow us on Instagram at Beauty and the Baby and don't forget to visit the website website at www.beautyandthebaby.com. Guys, listen, I am here with my co-host Kylie Money of Parenting Made Joyful and Sasha Dixon. <laughs> Dixon with Mamas of Many. I'm so excited, guys, about my co-hosts. They are doing absolutely amazing. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this journey. Thank you for, having, for having us. us. Yes. So basically what I wanted to share is, you know, there's a topic going around. I don't know if y'all know this. It's floating in social media land about uh, women actually having a baby over uh, 40. Mm. But the thing is, is I see the men actually want these babies. What do y'all think about that? Yes. I think I think it's a good subject to talk but, about. But you know, if you think about it, like being over forty, kind of I, for me, I'm 42, 43. So I be thinking, like, is it a health risk? Is something you know, what would happen to me if I do? You know, if I decide to have, well, I don't know if I want to have another day. <laughs> <laughs> I be want to travel the world, okay? But I'm just saying, for those moms who are actually getting, uh, who are actually thinking about conceiving. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some of the advice that, you know, or what are some things you would want to know if that was you're in that position? I mean, I'm not in that exact position, but I had my first baby at 38 and I'm going to be having this baby at 39. Wow. And after 35, I believe it's mm -hmm. considered geriatric, which yes. is comical to me, uh, but that's what it's considered. Um, I think the only thing that concerns me is the minor medical risks that are associated with it as you get older. Mm. Um, but I also lived in New York for the last 11 years where most people uh, are waiting closer to 40 to have babies. Oh, wow. So it doesn't feel as abnormal in a city like that. I think it feels more abnormal when you leave um, bigger metro mm. uh, mm -hmm. city areas. Um, they were saying also that <clears throat> preeclampsia was also a big thing with um when you get pregnant over 40. So you, they wanted to make that, you know, or I guess open that up to everybody to make awareness of, to be aware of that. What do you, I mean, have you heard of that? I have, I have heard of um, preeclampsia. I, I know that many people can get preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. So for them to just put it strictly yeah. for that, mm -hmm. I disagree um, that, about that reasoning because anyone can get preeclampsia, whether you're young or older. Mm -hmm. I understand the higher risks yeah. as you get older. However, the way that it's presented, mm -hmm. it's not presented on a, a good platter. Yeah. You know, it doesn't make it warm and fuzzy for others to say, oh yeah, it's a good thing. But there's so many success stories out there. Yeah. And I feel like we should talk about both the risks and the successes. Yeah. Well, I, I saw a uh, you know article and also in the news where this couple was fifty and the husband was sixty five, and they made it work. And I thought that was so. That's so I was like, oh my god, because when when you know coming up, it's like you hear, honey, I'm not having a baby after forty years old, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that. But people are doing it now, and I love it. I love it. Yeah, parenthood is your own journey. It's so special and specific to you and your partner. And if you're not ready to start that journey until you're older, then that's wonderful. It means you're doing it when you are ready. And that's going to ultimately be better for your uh, children. Well, guess what? Summer is on. Hey, Summer. Hey, 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 hey Summer. <laughs> she's on and she, you know, I'm just curious to know what you think, Summer, about, you know, 40 and pregnant. I mean, you know, we're living the prime of our life. What you think here? So I found it really fascinating, the subject that we're talking about in regards to 
women being pregnant in their 40s. It's a hot topic. It's always talked wow. about. And okay. sometimes it's always like a shock, right? That we're pregnant in our 40s. Here's how much of a shock it can be to our system. I looked up some information and I came across um, Virginia Physicians for Women. And she had this question out there. How many eggs does a woman have at 40? Do you know that? I didn't. I had to look it up. I was like, this is amazing. Um, so when girls are born, they have a million in total eggs. Uh, and it brings out that the number declines as they age. So women lose about 30 immature uh, eggs a day. By the time women reach puberty, their ovaries contain 300,000 eggs. By the age of 30, they're down to 100,000 and estimates are about for, for the age of 40 is 20,000 eggs remaining. I find that it, it's amazing to me how the body is created for us to have babies. But the desire to have a baby in our 40s is becoming much more popular. And the reason that is, is because our life has kind of been delayed a lot. Like we've done our education, we got our careers, we had to wow. find okay. our um, partners, and it takes time. So our bodies, you know, in the meantime, are doing what's productively normal, which is losing our reproductive eggs. So by the time you reach your 40s, you're now ready. The struggle seems to be pretty hard to get pregnant. Now, not to be, you know, this to be depressing, but this is science. This is exactly what happens. So how can we improve that? I think it's very fascinating that it's both men and, and women. It's not just on women. And I think it needs to be an open subject on social media. I know infertility is coming out, but being pregnant in our 40s is actually pretty phenomenal. I find that most of my clients as a newborn care specialist working overnights are in their 40s and 50s. And they're so much happier. Like we get to enjoy it more. Um, just in retrospect, I had my kids in my 20s. I would definitely have a baby now. I would be much more able to handle being pregnant now. So, I mean, guys, like, you know, I love this topic because I think it's important for mm -hmm. us to share with the world that there's a community of women like ourselves who would actually are for it. You know, I mean, y'all. Yeah, absolutely. I support it. Yeah. I absolutely support it. I mean, in the community, like she said, the metropolitan areas, it's not uncommon. I mean, most of my clients are those who are over 40 years old. Yeah. And yeah, me too. They have waited because they wanted success, financial success. They wanted to go to school first. They didn't want to struggle <clears throat> to have their children, you know, in the earth and, you know, paycheck to right. paycheck. Exactly. They wanted to put their careers first. And I yep. feel like it is individualized. Like you said, mm -hmm. um, it's individualized for your family. I mean, you live life and you learn and you, you know what I'm saying? I think, I think personally, you know, being older and in my, in 43, I think starting to have a baby at the age of 43 probably would have been a yes for me because mm. as a young person, you're still building life. You're still building so much, but I think I appreciate 43 and my legacy. I appreciate oh, that more, you know what I'm saying? And so that to me, I just, I'm just, I love this conversation. I think there's more needed. And we're looking, we're looking, you know, to hear from you audience to see, you know, what you guys really think, because this topic is probably going to continue to go on and on and on. So, yeah. I mean, the other thing to think about when you are over 40 and having a baby, your, your medical team, your OB or your midwife, they're going to refer you to a maternal fetal health specialist if necessary. And they're going to make sure that you're educated and have the resources you need to make, make sure that you are safe and healthy in your pregnancy and that your baby is safe and healthy in the pregnancy. So I think there's a lot of fear around it, but then once you're actually doing it, there's a lot of support and a lot of resources. That's good. Um, I love what go. you said about support and resources. It is very important that we get the support and the resources that we need, especially um, being older because of the fact that, you know, if, especially with somebody's first baby in their 40. Yeah. It's important to have that and it's important to have community, you know, so. And you're also, you're also more mature. There when you, you get there mm -hmm. and you and can, 
and patient. Because, honey, <laughs> I'm 23, I was not patient. Yeah, and you can and you can be more patient. Um, you have a different view mm. on life, and you can center all of your attention on your building your family. Exactly. And also, one of the things that um, you you just mentioned about your team. You do have to, there's a process before that, mm-hmm. and they understand it, that you have to get nutritionists and all yeah. of that. You got to work on your body. Whereas when you're younger, you know, your body just works differently. Yeah. But you have that understanding as you become older that, hey, I got to prepare for this, mm-hmm. prepare my body for this and work a little harder towards it to make sure I'm advocating but I, I like what you just said real quick. I like what you just said because, you know, we can't be sitting up here eating a whole bunch of uh, Skittles and <laughs> Doritos talking about we about to get pregnant. But I just think that education is everything and we need that. Um, and just to kind of I don't think a person should get to the point where your age define your decision about conceiving or having a baby. I think it should be natural. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Everybody has to feel good about it. All right. So <laughs> this conversation is good. I think we could pick up on some more conversations um, later on in our episodes, but we're definitely going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, I'm so excited that y'all are here. Thank, Thank you. For me. Absolutely. Thank li- you for absolutely. Me. Listen, guys, next up is Sterling Simmons. When I tell you guys, you don't want to miss this segment. Why? Because she knows all too well about breastfeeding. And also she's going to talk about her own journey with breastfeeding. I can't wait to have this conversation. We're going to a commercial break right now. Dr. Jacqueline Walters, a board certified OBGYN and the medical director for Surrogacy Miracles and Consulting. And I'm Shadina Blunt, the founder, co-owner, and the executive director here at Surrogacy Miracles and Consulting. We welcome everyone, including the LGBTQ families. And we are here to assist you through this complex process and the journey. And together, we we are are Surrogacy Surrogacy Miracles Miracles and and Consulting. Consulting. We are back, guys, with my co-host right here. (laughs) Hey, guys. We are so excited to have Sterling on today. Sterling is amazing, you guys. When I tell you, oh, my God, I love her energy about breastfeeding. Uh, She's very motivational. And I I just go let her introduce who she is. Come on. (laughs) Hi, y'all. My name is Sterling Gray Simmons. I am a certified breastfeeding specialist as well as a full-spectrum doula. I service the metro Atlanta area in person, but I'm everywhere virtually. So that's me in a nutshell. I have three children, all of whom were exclusively breastfed. So I tell my clients that I have the lived experience of breastfeeding three children, as well as the learned experience of everything that I have learned over these last six years. I love the fact that you did, you know, you you talk about that because a lot of times as it relates to breastfeeding, Mm You know, I, I could kind of relate to my own breastfeeding when I started. I had no information. And I think it drove me to the, to the place of finding out more. Mm-hmm. Then I started getting more interested and I started liking what I was hearing. So talk about some of your breastfeeding challenges that you had before you became yeah. a lactation. <laughs> so I'm a first generation breastfeeder is what I tell people all the time. My grandmothers were of the generation that was targeted by formula companies. Mm-hmm. And they were basically told, you know, if you breastfeed, that's only for poor people. Um, so me being me, I'm a Sagittarius. I do what I want to do. <laughs> uh, when I got pregnant with my oldest and I told them that I was breastfeeding, I got a lot of eels. That's gross. And why do you want to do that? So I really didn't have anybody that I could get that support from. I couldn't ask any questions. So I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. But I went to Walmart when I was like seven months pregnant and saw that a can of formula was $30. And I was like, how long does this last? <laughs> no, I was like, I'm going to at least try to breastfeed. So um My first experience, like I said, I didn't know anything about breastfeeding. They held him up after he was born like he was on the Lion King. And they were like, here's your baby. And then they took him for like 45 minutes. And then they brought him back and they were like, mom, he's hungry. Here you go. And here's a pump. So I thought that's what I was supposed to be doing. Unbeknownst to me, it was not. (laughs) I had probably a Guinness World Record book 
uh, oversupply. Oh, wow. uh, I used to pump wow. a gallon of milk every day. Oh wow. my goodness. Wow. On top of the fact that I had a baby who would not take a bottle from me. Mm. So I got a freezer full of milk and a baby who won't take it. Uh, so that was a learning experience right. in itself. And that as well as the birth of my child, my second child uh, kind of drove me to get educated because I realized that there was a big gap outside of leaving the hospital where people really needed that support when they come home. Awesome. Right. Okay, so I have a question for you. Yeah. You know, I do have a grand, all of my, my grandbabies are breastfed, and um, but my, my one grandbaby, he is having a difficult time with the, the bottle. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding out is we, the mom, she wants to, she's tired, so she really wants to rest. Uh -huh. However, she don't mind breastfeeding either. My thing is, is how do we get him? Because he, 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 I put the bottle in his mouth. He like, just playing with it. How do we get this bottle to, to act like a breast? So with that, it, the thing is, a lot of people who have breastfed babies deal with that because they just kind of shove the bottle into the baby's mouth. And what happens is baby have um, a reflex that basically causes them to do this before uh, they're six months, which is why you can't put a spoon in a baby's mouth. It prevents them from choking. So it's really something that's supposed to help them. But when people just kind of just put a bottle in a baby's mouth, they're going to do this and not want the bottle. Right. So when we are given the bottle, we want to aim it towards the roof of the mouth and try to get them to latch onto the bottle in a similar way that they would have to take the breast. Okay. Um, so it's all in the technique and, you know, just also trying different types of bottles because some bottles babies just have a preference and they haven't even, you right, know, right. had other bottles, but they know, hey, this is not it. Okay. So um, I would suggest working with a lactation professional and just seeing what's the correct way to get baby to latch onto the bottle instead of just forcefully giving it to them. Well, I know you know already, but I have a bunch of goodies for you. So let's pull out some of our goodies, guys. <laughs> Ooh, look at the baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's so, like a real baby. Yes, too. <laughs> I got him weighted because he's eight pounds. Oh my a lot God. of people have never... That one hold a baby? <laughs> yeah. A lot of people, when I'm teaching breastfeeding, um, I find this is better to do positioning with instead of just a regular baby doll, especially for the dads who may have never held a baby. So when I'm showing mom, say like, hey, this is the football hole. She can actually see what it's like with a baby instead of me just giving her gotcha. a little baby doll. Can so you demonstrate let, the let's, football? Let's, let, let, I'm going to pull out some of this stuff up in here. Yes. Oh, God, you got some breasts up in here. <laughs> <laughs> so these are my hands-free teaching aids. Um, I designed these because I wanted an easy way to teach breastfeeding without having to hold the bottle, having to hold the breast. So I put them around my neck like this. Um, I also got them made with large areolas, areolas. because. A lot of people's breasts look like this, and mm -hmm. they don't really see much representation. Um, and I've had clients who come and they'll say, hey, the lady at the hospital told me that all of my areola has to be in the baby's mouth, and they'll be bawling their breasts up like this. Mm -hmm. So I found that this is a really good way to yeah. demonstrate breastfeeding. So um, you asked to see the football hole? Yes. So, I love this football hole. <laughs> my baby that's my it. favorite, favorite Oh, sideline was my favorite it. position because I, I like it. to sleep. And that was the only way I got any risk. So what we're going to do is we're going to go nose to nipple. We're going to aim the nipple at the baby's nose. And then we're going to bring it down like this. And mm -hmm. that's going to help baby to open wide right. to get a good latch. Mm -hmm. And then this is, we're going to move this pillow a little bit. This is football position. So we're just going to hold baby like this. And we have our hands behind baby's ears. And we can do some sandwich, boob sandwiches, or a little bit of compression and massage while we have baby. So this is the football hole. So let, let me let me try it. <laughs> Here you go. See if I can try this. Y'all, I'm about to, I'm 43. <laughs> I ain't did this in a while. So let's how you hold that baby? <laughs> See, I like this part here, there you like go. this, and I'll just lay and back lean and on back. Go and that's called laid back breastfeeding. That's really good for moms who have large breasts, as well as moms who may have had a C-section, who really can't have baby on their stomach um, pressing. You, you know, and I also heard about the burping. Like breastfed babies, you know how people they yeah. were so they want to burp, burp, burp. I was like. Breastfed babies don't really. You don't have to break yeah, them all the time. Um, if you have a baby who is prone to spitting up mm -hmm. or um, just tends to have a lot of hiccups or yeah. gas or things like that, then of course you can break, you can burp baby. But it's not the same as you know a baby drinking a bottle who is going to be taking in all that extra air. Awesome! Oh wow! Now listen, listen. 
this here is a lifesaver. Okay. I yes. always refer this to uh, my family because a lot of times in the middle of the night, they don't want to pull out those pumps. pumps. And mm -hmm. so I always tell them to use a haka. Mm -hmm. And I tell them to get two hakas because it yeah, actually works. I love this stuff. <laughs> but this is huge. Where you get this from? So this one is, <laughs> oh, I did not bring it. But this one is the Gen 3. Mm -hmm. So this one, I really like this one because I can have my clients to pump into this. And then I can take the top off of this. And there's a bottle nipple that goes with oh, this. And it can literally be a I bottle. I like that. Um, and I like this one as well because this it's wider base than a lot of the other hakas. And I can tell my clients to do breast massage and things like that without it breaking the suction. If there's a, a breast in there and I can demonstrate. You know what I didn't Ooh. understand about the haka when I first, cause I just finished breastfeeding my first baby. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't understand that you had to roll it down. Yes, I was just about oh, to yeah, say Oh yeah, you gotta roll the haka down. A lot of down. people try to just kind of just put their boob on it and then they're like, why is it falling well, off? I just kind of squeezed all the air out and I was like, well, it's on. Mm -hmm. And I did that for like two weeks. Yeah. I'm like, why isn't this? You should have been following me on social media. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I can show you how to use it. Um, you Like she said, you want to fold it back like this. And then you squeeze the bottom to create the suction. And then you just let it latch on and you flip it back like this. Yep. And you can also use, a lot of people use this as a milk catcher, but you can also use it as a pump. So you can just see that squeezing oh, right there. And I like that better because it mimics the natural pumping mm -hmm. versus yes. because let's talk, ooh, let's really talk about that like a lot of times we have these myths about you have to pump 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 especially right after the hospital i don't have my clients <laughs> pump at all yeah. i'm like no you heard the, what happened to me yeah. with doing that yeah. um so i don't typically recommend my clients to start pumping until they're close to six weeks mm -hmm. um if mom has to go back to work before yeah. six weeks then of course we can figure that out around four to six weeks but we want to give the body time to regulate yes. you want your body to understand how much your baby actually drinks in a 24-hour period before you start introducing the pump because what's going to happen is you're going to create an oversupply and your body's going to think that your body that your baby needs all this extra milk and then you're going to be up at two o'clock in the morning and your sheet's going to be wet and yeah exactly <laughs> and the baby's going to be wet and you're going to have a freezer full of milk so in theory an oversupply sounds good and people are always like oh i'd rather have too much milk than not enough milk but i'm telling you from somebody who has lived this experience <laughs> it is not fun <laughs> Uh, when your breasts are always hard, you know, you have mastitis and clogged ducts. And like I said, I have been up plenty of nights changing sheets because I was wet. The baby was wet. The bed was wet. Yeah. And it was just terrible. You know, I know my co-hosts have questions, but I wanted to ask this real quick because I know many of you may even also have this question. The thing about lactation cookies. Mm -hmm. First of all, I have I have, now I have I do have a lactation cookies, but I'm not gonna refer it on here. But when I tell you my father's be eating them up, they're they delicious. eat them up. Yes, they, they do. do. They eat up the, the lactation cookies. However, I'm getting now into soup, mm -hmm. and I'm really finding that soup works and it helps with the nutrition. It helps with the milk production. Yes. It helps with so much more versus giving the tea or, or the, the or the cookies and it's more oh. nutritional because they're getting those greens and those you know those healthy mm -hmm. nice. healthy carbohydrates yeah. or carbs yeah i tell people all the time um so the lactation cookies the drinks all that kind of stuff is not anecdotal so it doesn't right. work across the board so you may eat a cookie and be like oh my gosh i had milk everywhere and somebody else could be like girl i ate the whole box and nothing <laughs> happened so um it's not it doesn't work for everybody but i tell people you know if that's something that you want to try give it a try it's a great way to get extra nutrients in you if you're somebody who gets really busy with baby and you forget to eat it's a great way to make sure that you are introducing that type of stuff in your body but it's not an end-all be-all the best way to increase um Breast milk production is skin to skin and frequently emptying the breast. Right. So, um, and staying hydrated, of course. Right. Well, guys, listen, we're going to come right back after this commercial break. We're going to wrap this conversation up and just ask some more questions and wrap it all up. <laughs> The feeling of being a mother for the first time can be mesmerizing. However, it also comes with a great deal of responsibility. Taking care of a newborn can be really exhausting during the initial months. 
So how are you supposed to take on that role? Introducing Ask a Doula, a transition guide for new mothers. Ask a Doula is the new mommy's toolbox for birth preparation and postpartum care that will make you feel at ease, empowered, and supported in your journey as a mom-to-be. Order today from Amazon. Welcome back, guys. Listen, we are here still with Sterling Simmons, breastfeeding educator. She's absolutely phenomenal. And we want to thank you so much for being on the show. But I know we had a couple more questions for you. And I think, um, Sasha? Yes, I had a question. So I'm a lactation educator as well. Oh, and right. so um, I wanted to, when you were talking, when we had the breasts out here, mm -hmm. and so you know how um, it's round. Have you heard that babies can breastfeed in any position um, because the areola and everything is is rounded. Mm. So basically like baby can breastfeed this way, laid yeah. back. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even like over your yeah, shoulder when they get say, bigger because that's what say, they do. You know, I call that gymnastics. Yes. Because, you know, once they get to the point where they can stand up, they will be over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. They will be thinking that you are like Elastigirl and want to take your nipple with them to the next room. Yes. So, you know, they they can breastfeed in any position. Um in the beginning, you know, it's easier to hold them and, you know, get them in a position that works best for you. But, you know, once they are more in control of the session, you know, that's all out the window. <laughs> because, yeah. like I said, they do what they want to do with your, your breast. I love, love. My favorite part of breastfeeding is when the baby is, like, on your chest and they kind of, like, bop their head yes. to that to part. Yes. They know exactly. exactly. They're so smart. That is, they know exactly what yeah. they're doing. I tell people all the time, that is a hunger cue called rooting. So uh, you can also, I call it bobbing for apples because a yes. lot of babies are that like, is, is this a boob? Is this a boob? Is this a boob? I'm looking for a boob. <laughs> Anybody got a boob? Um, and it's amazing that babies can come fresh out of the womb and you can put them on your stomach mm -hmm. and they can literally drag themselves to find the areola and to find the the breast. Uh, this is with babies like a few minutes old. And I tell people all the time, this is also why your areolas get bigger during pregnancy, because this is like a bullseye for babies. Babies don't have the best sense of eyesight, but they have a great sense of smell and they have a, um, what they can see is darker colors and big things. So they can be like, oh, I need to be up there. And they can drag themselves directly to the breast and they can latch themselves on like right out of the womb. So I always awesome. thought that was a question for you. Mm -hmm. What is like the number one question you get when you're working with a first time parent? <laughs> like the biggest thing that to you is a no brainer, but to new parents is just so mysterious. Um, hmm. I get a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, so the biggest one would probably be when will they get their cycle? Mm. Uh, a lot of people, mm. you know, hear that or that they cannot get breastfeeding is birth control. So I get a lot of people who want to know, oh. <laughs> who want to know, can oh, they get is, huh? pregnant? You know, can they get pregnant while they're breastfeeding? Um, and I tell them, yes, it is possible. Uh, so what happens with that is I can speak from, again, first time experience. With me, I'm one of those people who the entire time that they're breastfeeding, I do not have a cycle. Mm. So I breastfed my son, my youngest son, for uh, 23 months. Ooh. So you add that 23 months to the nine months that I was pregnant, I went quite a while without having a cycle. But it don't come back right on if you, when you stop. No, right? it did not come mm. right back. Um, and it wasn't, you know, regular or anything like that even afterwards. But then there's other people who get their cycle six weeks or, you know, yeah. right after giving birth. Uh, so it really just depends on your body. And there's nothing wrong if you do have a cycle or if you don't but breastfeeding is not birth control <laughs> so I just really like to let people know that even if you aren't having a cycle you can still be ovulating and you can definitely get pregnant yes, uh, so, sure oh I think I think hey Summer hi, Summer, hi, she, hi, wants, Summer she has hey, a question Summer. as well but, so yeah I want to ask this question what are some of the myths while you're coaching or teaching a client about breastfeeding have you found to debunk or have found that it's true. I'd love to you to explain that. Thank, Thank you, Summer. Summer. Thank you. Okay, so Summer's question was about the myths mm -hmm. associated with breastfeeding. I think I just touched on one about the fact that you cannot get pregnant. That is a big myth. Um, another one is that you have to toughen up your breast 
beforehand to breastfeed. I have had clients who come to me and they'll be like, oh, my mother-in-law told me that I had to rub my breast with sandpaper to get my oh, breast God. prepared for, oh, for breastfeeding. Like, and I'm like, that is torture. Why would somebody oh. tell you that? So you do not have to do anything to prepare your breast. Everybody's like, oh, my God, my breast. <laughs> <laughs> you do not have to do anything to prepare your breast for breastfeeding um, other than, you know, I would just say take a breastfeeding class. That would be all the preparation I would tell you to do. Um, another one would be that, um, again, you can't breastfeed while you're pregnant. Uh, there are, if you are not high risk um, and you're not somebody who is in risk of, you know, going into preterm labor, you can breastfeed all the way through your pregnancy and then even do what's called tandem feeding, is, which is where you oh. feed a newborn and your baby. Baby, yeah. I imagined that when I got pregnant for the second time, I was going to be able to nurse. Mm -hmm. What ended up happening for me is my baby knew I was pregnant before I did. Wow. It felt, it felt that way because she nursed beautifully. Up until, in, in hindsight, I realized I was about five weeks pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, and then she just stopped. She weaned. She was like, something's going on here. It's not for me. Yeah. And I couldn't understand. And I kept trying all these different positions. And said, what's going on? What's wrong? Mm -hmm. And it was about a week later, I took a pregnancy test. And she was like, I'm done with those. Oh, wow. Done. Yeah. Sometimes wow. that happens. Um, the composition will change. Or the, the scent composition? or something. Yeah. What does that mean? So just the makeup of breast milk. So as we know, okay. breastfeeding, breast milk is always evolving. It's never the same milk mm -hmm. um, regard from month one to month two, month three, month four. So it's always evolving. So the fact that you were pregnant again, something could have changed in the in the chemicals or in the balance or something. And she just was like, nope, this is, sure <laughs> this, is, this is not what I want. This is not what I'm used to. And then some people will make it all the way through their breastfeeding journey and all the way through their pregnancy. And then the baby will get the colostrum. Again, um, the older baby. And they'll oh, say, wow. oh, no, thank you. Yeah, I don't, don't want, want that. that because or some people will say, hey, I breastfeed my my newborn first to make sure that they're getting the colostrum and then I breastfeed to get my older baby. So it really just depends, but it always is evolving. So maybe baby just tasted a component of it that was not her, her cup of tea. Was <laughs> and she was like, no, thank you. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So one of the questions I get a lot of, um, is why does baby eat so much on the breast? You know, can you answer that for everyone that may want to know it in our um, viewing audience? Most definitely. So I have um, some newborn stomach sizes over here. Um, and oh, thank you very much. So I tell people all the time, this is the size of a newborn stomach. And this is the size of a one-month-old stomach. Um, if you were on a liquid diet <laughs> and you, <laughs> you pee and you poop one good time, you would imagine it doesn't take much to fill or empty this. And a reason why they, they breastfeed a lot is what's called cluster feeding. is because they have to stretch their stomach from this at one day old to this at one month. Mm -hmm. So they do that by nursing frequently. Um, and it's also that newborns have a need to suck. So it's not yeah. always about hunger. It's not always about thirst. Sometimes it's for comfort. Sometimes they might have gas and they're just like, I need, I need some comfort. Mm -hmm. um, they might hear a sound that they've never heard before and it startles them. I tell my clients all the time, when in doubt, whip it out. Like we just, <laughs> I love we that. just pull the boob out for everything around here. It doesn't have to be a watch the, the clock type thing. And another thing that I say all the time is watch your baby, don't watch the clock. Because as a new mom, it's so easy to be like, oh my God, I just fed you. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm so tired of that. I, I have been known to go to houses and take the clocks down because wow. I don't want you to be looking at the clock exactly. and being Timing. aware of the fact that it's only exactly. been 15 minutes and then yeah. you're stressing yourself and worrying if what you're doing is enough. Wow. Well, Sterling, you have given us a lot of information and we are so excited about it. Um, you know, you guys have any you know, good I'm good. She is very informed. informed. She rocks your baby all through the whole. You, know, you are smart. very well informed. Thank and so you. thank you. Thank, thank you for you. answering thank our questions. Yeah, thank you. Well, guys, listen, this show is all about nutrition. Up next, my guest is all the way from Savannah, Georgia. Her name is Renata. Nami. And when I tell you guys, she, you are in for a treat. She's going to be talking about tongue ties and all. I am so excited and can't wait to hear what she has to say. We'll be right back after this commercial break.
Hey guys, welcome back. So right here with me is Renata. Hey. hey. Well, welcome and thank you so much for being here. You know, I am very passionate about what you do. Um, so I really want you to just kind of tell our audience actually what you do, but I am very passionate because I have a lot of babies that literally have tongue ties. Mm -hmm. And once we, they go see an ENT, boom they can breastfeed a lot of times. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they're not very successful. And then once they do the um, clipping, yes. then they start breastfeeding and it's a wrap from there. <laughs> Go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Thank you. So my name is Renata Nami. I am an orofacial myofunctional therapist and a dental hygienist. And um, we are well-rounded with muscle dysfunction. So we pretty much are kind of like um, physical therapists for the head and neck area. Uh, we're dealing with kids that thumb suck, have a tongue thrust, tongue tie, have breathing issues, which lead to sleep issues. Um, and I am extremely passionate about babies. I breastfed, I'm still breastfeeding my uh, youngest one. Um, so I'm a huge breastfeeding advocate and very well trained in tongue ties. With that being said, I do not treat babies. I start my patients usually at four or five years old. But since I'm educated, I feel comfortable talking about it. Um, it's not very simple as just going and getting a tongue tie release. Mm. The release itself is not going to fix anything. You have to make sure you're looking at everything from an interdisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. So just going to an ENT or a pediatric dentist and getting the release done, a lot of times is not going to give the mom all the benefits yeah. that, that they need for the breastfeeding relationship to work. Um, so working with an IBCLC, which is an international board certified lactation consultant, mm -hmm. uh, somebody that is well versed in ties. And I usually tell all my patients or uh, my patients who are pregnant, uh, go ahead and call around, you know, have an interview with a, with a IBCLC, um, learn, take a breastfeeding class, try to get as much information as you can before you have that baby, uh, because we all know that after we're in the hospital or at home, whenever you're having your child, things change and, you know, you're not really thinking and there's hormones and there's just so much happening. Uh, and whenever you bring the baby on and you're having pain, you know, you're just not thinking straight. So if you have this information before you even get there, uh, it's a lot more helpful and hopefully your breastfeeding relationship yeah. um, will last longer. Absolutely. You know, one thing I wanted to say is I did learn something new from watching your program. Um, and one of those things was that the massage, I thought it was excellent. And I even went and looked at the website and then I called um, um, a few people and it mm -hmm. was like y'all need to go do this <laughs> go to the massages do the baby because i i learned that you you were saying something about the massages help but what it, what does that do like um so there's several therapies that the baby might need whenever you you have a baby that is super tight has sort of colis um some professionals like a physical therapist or an occupational therapist, they perform something called craniosacral therapy, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of like a chiropractic adjustment, but it doesn't look like they're doing anything. They're literally just barely holding the baby, but they are feeling things around and loosening them up. That's very important to do while um, in the process of getting a tongue tie release. Um, and then there's some intraoral massages that some professionals who are trained in oral motor work they can go inside the mouth intraorally and um, do some massages for these muscles because these muscles are all tight and you can kind of tell which babies you know will just clamp down and will be um, hurt the mom that way. You can touch and feel if your professional allows okay. you to do that. Uh, but those really help the baby kind of relax and release. Uh, there's a professional in South Carolina. I've been to his office while he's doing releases, Dr. Rao, he's amazing. Um, and he has a craniosacral therapist in his office. So she works with the baby. It's amazing. They turn the lights down and she works with the baby for about 15 minutes before they even do the release. And it's insane. The baby literally just melts in her hands. Wow. And they're so much calmer and the release is extremely fast and goes straight to the mom's breast right afterwards uh, to breastfeed. But it's so important to keep going with therapy sessions. So either craniosacral or a chiropractor, 
depending on what that baby needs, everybody's different. Um, you need to do that after the release is done. You have to do stretches, which uh, depending if the, well, if with babies, yes, you, you don't get uh, stitches. So you do have to do stretches after the tongue tie release because otherwise it will reattach, reattach is healing. Um, another thing is that you have to make sure it's done properly. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many people do you hear saying that they had a tongue tie release or a lip tie release and they didn't notice a difference? Right. A lot of times a professional is not well trained. These things are not very well taught in dental school or medical school. Mm -hmm. So these are courses that they have to take after they have gotten out from school um, to be able to really learn how to properly do um, a release or a functional release. Wow, that is amazing. I mean, like what in, when you, when they, why do they have to clip? Like that's what I really want to know because I'm hearing so many different things about that. Like I'm hearing, you don't really have to do it, or you do, you just need to do massages, or like, what is the... Oh, myofascial release. Yeah, myofascial release. So myofascial release, um, it's a little bit different. They say that they can stretch a freedom and they can release fascia. So fascia, if you think about a piece of steak or meat, have you ever thought about that, the little white thing that yes. covers kind of the whole meat? That's fascia. It covers all, all of our muscles. Um, and some people say that by doing certain massages or myofascial release, uh, they can stretch fascia. Um, I have heard reports that that is not accurate. Um, the frenum is made of connective tissue. So no, you cannot stretch a frenum. Uh, if a baby is born with oral dysfunction, you can put that baby whatever position you would like and maybe you will find a position that's okay for that baby to successfully breastfeed, but you're not fixing the oral dysfunction. You still have to address that. It's very important. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like that's like I never even knew that, you know, like there was even somebody out here that's doing this stuff. You know what I mean? Because what we're told is to, mm -hmm. you know, go see an ENT or a dentist or and so tongue ties can inf uh, impact so much more. You know, you can have speech issues. You can have feeding issues. Uh, that's what I wanted to ask you. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, you walked right into it. But that's what I wanted to ask. How can you have neurological issues? So yeah, it's kind of like a snowball effect. If you have a tongue tie, you're more prone to mouth breathe. If you mouth breathe, it's shown that it's about 18% less oxygen that goes into your brain. Mm. If you do that through your whole life, there are studies that show that those people have lower IQs. Um, so maybe in that sense, yes, you can have some neurological issues from having a tongue tie, but it's not necessarily just a tongue tie. It's everything else that the tongue tie is impacting. Um, feeding is very important to look at. Usually a baby cannot lateralize the tongue you know, going from side to side to properly be able to chew um, and accept certain textures and be able to swallow properly. Um, so those are babies that will not eat meat, you know, and I've yeah. had patients say, oh, no, my child just decided to be a vegetarian at four years old. Really? Mm. <laughs> they just don't want to because maybe one time they choked, you know, and now they immediately they would just avoid it. They didn't want to be around it. So... It is a difficult decision just having a baby and deciding to go through something like a tongue tie release, but it's about what 15 seconds, five to 15 seconds of a laser uh, procedure, um, and then the baby's put on the mom, mom's breast right away. Whenever you talk about circumcision, yeah. that is so much more well accepted. About 75% of um, you know baby boys in the United States are circ circumcised and it's about 15 minutes mm -hmm. uh, of a baby screaming and crying wow for no yeah. apparent functional um, you know resolve right there so uh, we kind of have to change how we are looking at these things because it can affect your life uh, in other other ways um, so being more educated, that's why I'm so passionate about Airway Circle, being more educated and bringing this to other professionals and other uh, parents. You, you know, if you know this information before you go into it, you're more likely to make an informed decision. Wow, that, that's a lot of information. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, this is great. Um, like, where, where, where are you? I know you're located 
In Savannah. In Savannah. So do you have a practice in Savannah? I do. So I'm a myofunctional therapist in Savannah. Uh, most of my patients, I see them online. Um, and then the rest of my time, I do airway circle. So you have like an online type, like different methods and techniques that you kind of do um, with your families? Yeah, so I'm getting these babies that were not released. I'm getting these, these kids that still have oral dysfunction at four or five years old. Wow. So these are kids, you know, a lot of thumb sucking, tongue thrust, um, feeding issues. They don't like certain textures. They're hyper during the day because they're not sleeping or breathing well. Um, there's so many issues that my functional therapy can help with. But we're pretty much working on um, nasal breathing. That's what I was going to Tongue position. You. So your tongue has to be suctioned to the roof of your mouth day and night. Just like that. Okay. Uh, lip seal. Your lips should supposed to be closed always so you can breathe in through your nose. And then we look at functional chewing and swallowing to make sure that those things are working properly. Oh, and how long is the sessions for? And what does that look like? Well, as you can tell, I talk a lot. So my <laughs> sessions, my sessions usually go to an hour. It's usually 30, 45 minutes. But um, I, you know, I talk to my patients about everything. They become my friends. I want to know how their family's doing. So we end up going a little bit longer. But usually sessions take about 30 minutes. I can keep my patients from four months to a year. It depends on what the issues are. Um, I see adults also. Uh, most of these adults have more of a sleep issues. Sleep apnea, UARS, um, we can help with, with all of that. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming and being a part of the show. This thank is absolutely amazing. Me. The information is new for me, so I'm excited about learning more. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you for having me. me. Absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. We'll be back with, um, we'll be back talking about IVF and fertility with our guest, um, Jerry, Alicia, and also Penelope McCown. We'll be right back after this moment.